The world is full of trouble. Trouble for every living thing. Problems of every sort in an inexhaustible quantity. Even if a creature seems all but unassailable, you can rest safe in the guarantee that something out there is ruining its life one way or another. Case in point, the wasp. The wasp is a creature that excels in ruining the days of other creatures most of the time. They are aggressive predators, and the more sociable species may attack in numbers sufficient to drive off creatures many times their size. Yet it is the solitary wasp that is often more terrifying. The creature that paralyzes its prey and hides it away in earthen cells to be eaten alive by ravenous offspring. Or the disturbing parasitoid that simply skips all the middle steps, injecting its eggs into living creatures to have them eaten away from within. Now to give the devil his due, it would be unfair to declare a wasp as a unilaterally evil creature. On the contrary, their predatory exploits are an important part of proper ecological function. Doing away with such macabre little monsters would only lead to a pestiferous proliferation of plague proportions. The point I'm making here is simply this. A wasp is perhaps the last creature one would expect to be targeted for a grisly fate. Between their venomous stings and their often violent dispositions, it would appear that there is very little that could possibly trouble them. Yet it seems that Mother Nature is endlessly inventive when it comes to such cruelties. Every so often one might see a wasp with an odd incongruity about its abdomen, a curious protrusion from between two segments of the exoskeletal armor plating. This outward sign indicates a most unpleasant little creature at work. There is an order of insects known as the Strepsiptera. More commonly, they are called twisted-winged parasites. Genetic analysis suggests they are cousins to the beetles, though they have diverged a long ways from these relatives. Regardless of their affiliations, they appear to be a surprisingly successful group. There are several hundred species described thus far, and each has a favored insect target. Some will parasitize cockroaches, others grasshoppers, or mantids, or leafhoppers, or silverfish. Some of the most well-known of these parasites are in the genus Stylops, and these creatures generally prefer the bees and the wasps. It is best, perhaps, to begin with the earliest larval stage of these insects. These are known as Planidium larvae, which roughly translates into Wanderer larvae. The name shares its origin with the name for planets, which were also known as wandering stars to early astronomers. These strange creatures are exceptionally tiny, maybe a quarter of a millimeter long. Yet each possesses six somewhat abbreviated legs, with gripping structures included and a pair of long cerci on their abdomens that allows them to catapult themselves into the air. They also tend to have rather sturdy backward-facing bristles on most of their body segments. Their eyes are simple, but they can detect light levels and basic colors with them. This is all the equipment they need to find a host. When a suitable insect draws near enough, a wasp in the case of many species, these tiny larvae will leap onto the creature. They find their way to the abdomen and begin to wedge themselves between the segmental armor plates. Their minuscule size, sturdy shape, and backward bristles make them well suited to this endeavor. At the bottom of this gap, they find an expanse of relatively thin, flexible exoskeleton. This is breached using a combination of enzymes and mechanical means, and the creature slips inside. In subsequent molts, the legs are lost, and the larva quickly comes to resemble a largely formless grub. There is a head of sorts, and this is oriented towards the outside. As the parasite grows, it eventually fills most of the wasp abdomen, and its cephalothorax begins to peek out from between the segments. What happens next depends on whether this grub is a male or a female. If it is a female, it simply molts through a pupal stage and into another grub-like creature. This dubious adult begins to give off pheromones to attract a suitable mate. If the larva is a male, a very different creature emerges from the pupal stage. It is a small insect regardless of the species. The largest might reach 7 millimeters in length, while the smallest are closer to 1 millimeter long. Such is often the way with parasites, as they must usually be smaller than whatever host they are exploiting. The male adult Strepsipteran is a winged creature. 
Despite the small size, these insects are entirely flight capable with a large pair of fan-shaped hindwings. What would be front wings in most insects are reduced here to a pair of haltiers, which act as sensors and stabilizers. Houseflies have something similar, but in their case it is the hind wings that are modified in this way, while the front wings carry out proper flight. There is also a set of functioning legs, allowing these parasites to clamber about on surfaces and hang on as needed. Some of the most unusual features are the prominent eyes and antennae. The antennae often bear a vague resemblance to a pair of misshapen hands with several bloated fingers. They have ample chemoreceptors, allowing the male to detect a female's pheromones from a fair distance. The eyes look vaguely like a pair of blackberries. They are quite unconventional as insect eyes go. In most insects, each facet of the compound eye produces only a single dot of color in the insect's perception, much like a pixel on a computer screen. In these little parasites, each of the eyes forms a complete image, though it is a rather low-resolution one. Their visual perception seems to be a sort of collage of several simple images spun together to make something sufficient for navigation on the wing. One thing these winged males lack is a functioning digestive system. They do not feed as adults and live for only a matter of hours. These hours are spent in a frantic search for a female before their energy reserves run out. When they find a female, still wedged inside the abdomen of an unfortunate wasp, one can guess what happens next. However, one might not guess some of the more disturbing details. Recall that the female meets the world head first. It is her cephalothorax that is protruding from the host. One might expect something a bit more posterior for mating, but that is not the case here. There is a deep fissure in this anterior body region, and this is the male's target. He punctures the thin exoskeleton at the bottom of this fissure and introduces the sperm directly into the body cavity of the female, sometimes known as the hemoseal. This hemoseal is essentially the space between the internal organs, filled with hemolymph. This is bad enough for the female, or so I would suppose, but it gets worse. Sperm finds egg within this hemoseal, and the eggs develop into voracious little larvae. These creatures consume their mother from within, eating her alive. They find their way out into the world through an opening near the fissure, which functions as a sort of birth canal. It is not uncommon for a single female to produce thousands of little planidium larvae, which is just as well as she only gets one chance at such a process. So, after devouring their mother, these little menaces emerge into the world to seek out a suitable new host. They are exceptionally active little creatures as they are living on borrowed time. Much like their erstwhile fathers, they have limited energy reserves. If they don't find a host to make a meal of, they're not going to be dining on anything else. This is part of why so many are produced. It is a simple numbers game with these parasites. Produce thousands of hungry little larvae, and if only a handful ever find a host, the species will continue. The fact that the majority simply starve to death is of little importance, so long as these few survive. That is perhaps an irony in its own right. These little monsters that make other creatures' lives so miserable seem to have pretty miserable lives themselves. Such is often the way with nature, though among the insects, such miseries seem to be especially prominent.